Pace. Um, and that's my email address and that's my phone number. So if after this you want to contact me, feel free to do so. Um, I'm quite happy for people to take photographs. Um, Can you call it clicker? Sorry, if you haven't. Yeah, that one. Okay. So if I start at the end, <coughs> the end point is really about when a player moves into play professional rugby or moves into play international rugby, they've got to do a lot of different demands in that sport. <coughs> they've got to do with demands of lifting somebody. Quite often lifting somebody weighs 120 kilos. We've got to have that person who may be weighing 120 kilos managing to stay straight up in the air, have their trunks stable so they can catch the ball. We've got to be strong enough to be able to hit a guy in a tackle again, a guy who's maybe 120 kilos or a guy who's 110 kilos moving quickly and be able to hit him and drive him back potentially. Or if we've the guy with the ball, we've got to have good footwork to try and not get into that situation ideally and break through the gap, we've got to have the speed to go through, we've got to have a pretty decent engine to do this, move these movements again and again and again, and obviously we've got the unit of the scrum, where we've got some very big men, and I know you're not supposed to walk across the screen, but I've got to do that now for a second, uh, we've, got, we've got some very big men pushing against each other, so rugby is a very multifaceted game, and the things that over the last 10, 20 years that has gone sky high in terms of physical development is strength. If we look at player speed in 1994 and player speed in 2014, not much different, no, no markable difference. If we look at their fitness, as in running fitness, players now are across the board fitter because they're, they're in a full-time environment, but in terms of strength, they're completely off the scale of what they used to be. And in fact, in body mass. And that body mass is, is on the whole pretty decent body mass. If you look at a team now compared <coughs> to the team before, they're, they're much leaner than they were on the whole. So the guys in the, nine, the previous World Cup though, the backs in the previous World Cup were approximately the same weight as the forwards were 20 years ago. So that's the game like it or not, some people may say I don't like that game anymore, but that, that's the reality, that's the game that those people are in. And that's the game that when we're younger, we have to develop for. So. What age should we start to specialise? Well, one of the worst things you can do in sports, in sports like rugby, football, basketball, cricket, etc. One of the worst things you can do is specialise too early. Because if you specialise early, with a kid at 12 or 13, and say, you're just going to do rugby, and you're just going to do a strength programme for rugby, and that's your be all and end all, one, you're likely to break him physically, two, potentially break him mentally, and three, he might actually have the the wherewithal to be an international canoeist or pianist. But you're just sending him down there. So, in terms of special and specialisms, we want to give kids a multilateral development when they're younger, both from a physical point of view and a game point of view. But I'm going to ask a lot few questions. <coughs> I'm going to ask a little question here. At what Age. So who thinks that you shouldn't lift any weights at all until you're 18? 16. Put the hands go up. 14. Hold your hands. 12. Hands go up now. Younger. One, two. Right. Position statements of American College of Sports Medicine, all the paediatric organisations, 
a um, Strength and Conditioning Association in the United States, Strength and Conditioning Association in Australia, and over here, Music and Conditioning from seven or eight. But that doesn't mean to say you have to. But this idea that doing some form of strength training that is going to stunt your growth or make you short is nonsense. So let's get that out of the way to start with. And if you want to know more, you can go on to our, if you can find your way around our website, you can find the position statement on it, backed up all by all the medical papers that covered it. But as I say, that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to start strength training at that age. But there's nothing to stop you doing it. We kind of already covered that one. Why should we start specialising in rugby? Well, in retrospective studies, most people who become great rugby players or great tennis players or great soccer players or cricket players or team sports players in general, what age did they specialise? Well, they tended to specialise and only specialise a bit at about the age of 15 to 16. They said, yeah, that's when I thought of myself as a tennis player rather than I'm going to play tennis. That's when I actually thought of myself as, yeah, I'm going to be a rugby player. Doesn't mean to say that they're actually going to make it as a rugby player, a tennis player or a cricket player, but that's when the time when they decided to concentrate a lot on it. Doesn't mean to say they did it exclusively, but they concentrated. And as they got older from that 15, 16, that became more, more took up more of their time. Anything before that tends to lead to overuse injuries. <coughs> in the States at the moment, there's a bit of a, a crisis of overuse injuries in pitchers in baseball, because they get the idea from various books, which I'm not gonna mention now, that you just have to practice and practice and practice and you can become a world star. So they get these kids to pitch and pitch and pitch, and then the happens is they get screwed shoulders, screwed elbows, etc., and they end up in casualty. And again, we had a conference, a composer, a symposium, a symposium on that a couple of years ago with the lead, leading experts around the world, and the symposium came up with a position statement, which again is available on our website. So that was a bit of an introduction. I want to move on now to a, an injury audit that we did uh, a couple of years ago. And it looks at the training incidence and severity um, in academy training, premiership training, and schools training. And for those who can't see that far at the back, the schools incidence is about 2.1, that's Injuries per thousand hours. Injuries were defined as what kept somebody out of the next game. The premiership was 2.6. You'd, you'd expect that because there are bigger blocks running into each other. And the academy was only 1.3. So the actual academy training was a lot safer than was schools training. Now I hope that that's improved and I'll explain why it's in, I think that it's improved. Well, let's go have a look at why that possibly was. So, if we looked at this pie chart of the distribution of training within the academies, and the when I say academies, this was basically 16 and up, the di and the distribution of training within the schools, we found that this was the amount of specific rugby training done in the academies, this was the amount of specific rugby training done in the schools, the am orangey amber thing. The weight training, that was the amount done in the academies. That was the amount done in schools. The prehabilitation, which is a big word for kind of preparation that's in simplistic terms. That was the amount done in the academies. That was the amount done in the schools. So, quite a large difference. And if we looked at the two main things that came out. Scrummaging and training in the gym were much more likely to cause injuries in school than in academies. Now, going back to that first slide about weight training, cycling is not safe if it's done badly, canoeing is not safe if it's done badly, basketball is not safe if it's done badly, 
weight training is not safe if it's done badly. On the whole, if any of those sports are done in a safe environment and coached well, they're okay. So, that was a comparison there. And, oops, sorry. <coughs> Basically, the results, the conclusions that came out of that was it was almost certainly that there was the injury, the injury rate was lower in the academies because there was better preparation of the players, less volume of rugby training, less contact, in, or certainly uncontrolled contact in the rugby training, and better coaching within the scrummaging and the weight, weight training activities, which is highlighted in this next slide. So I haven't got a gun with these things, I've got useless my fingers. So, the lessons. And number four, <coughs> that's going to be, hopefully, well, I don't hopefully, it will be, will be done after I've finished. The dissemination of good practice, both in here and then further outside, which I will discuss as well. So, strength development. If we use Judah Bomper's language, not everybody likes his language, but I'll use it because it's in many, many textbooks. The bits that I said right at the at the top, the rugby-specific strength, whether that's done in the gym or, off, or not in the gym, must be built on a large pyramid. A pyramid of what he calls anatomical ad adaptation, which is adapting the body for future training, then going to general strength, and finally for rugby-specific strength. If we if we don't have so if we don't have these and going to there, we're likely to injure players. We're likely to fast track them <coughs> and fast track them into chronic injuries potentially. So he would argue, and most people would argue at his time, that this should be taking a couple of years at least, and then gen and this should be again age specific and not just chronological age but biological age specific as to what the player, the young person, is able to do. And bearing in mind that these are young people, this should be general and not for rugby. And it should all be underpinned by <coughs> this. A lot of different names for it, but physical literacy. Physical literacy is being able to, to squat properly, like as if you want to, as if we see when we see, if you go places where people can sit down and drink, play cards and drink coffee, whatever they do in foreign countries for ages and ages and ages, rather than having to do that and then be able to fall over. It means be able to hop and land without falling over. It means be, be able to go into progressive position and not collapse into a, and collapse into a, on a, in a heap. So to be underpinned by physical literacy. And that physical literacy can involve a lot of other things. So it can involve body weight strength movements, it can involve speed and agility activities. It can involve manipulating another person's body. I'll mention that in a, in later on. <coughs> this stuff can be tested. That's just a common method, and that common method is called functional movement screening. There are a whole series of different ways which you can test a person's initial ability, what's their general flexibility like, what's their general motor coordination like. And this company, this Movement Dynamics, which is Kelvin Giles' company, I'm sure you on their website, you find stuff, and it can be chosen to, any of these things can be chosen to the local situation that benefit that for with each school or DPP or whatever. So let's have a look at quickly what anatomical adaptation is. It's normally done through some form of circuit training, normally. There are other methods as well. But basically it's developing people's tendons and ligaments, preparing those, which builds a foundation for future movement that, that then will have larger force put through it. Force of either in the weight room, force of moving another person, force in the scrum, etc. And really, that should be done for every kid. Now, people who are my age, or 
approximately my age may remember that actually they used to do some of that in primary school when they used to jump over gymnastic boxes and climb up walls and go along ladders and go through upside down through hoops and all sorts of things two or three times a week. And that if you went to schools in Europe, certainly in former Eastern Europe, you would have done a lot of that stuff as well. PE curriculum, particularly in the state sector, doesn't do that anymore. That is a kind of underpinning foundations. So, when I said about the anatomical adaptation and the, the physical literacy, one of the things I've just filmed actually, um, this is for community rugby, is about um, um, introduction to contact. <coughs> all different methods of introduction to contact, that's all cut into pieces at the moment, it'll be run for a two hour course and then it'll go on, go on to our website. But all this introduction to contact that, we've, that I've filmed is all about agility, all, a lot about agility, so movement patterns, responding to people, getting your feet close to people in the tackle, rather than being on your knees and tackling people, where there's no, there's no um, footwork. Where we're teaching people to be able to get low and maintain that position to get low in the safe and clearing out, but to be able to practice those with other people in a safe environment in, con in what's called combat conditioning. People don't like to sometimes like the term there, but I used it. But for, um, it's really good for manipulating your body, manipulating another person's body, really works on your trunk, etc. So that's part of it. And also the, the speed and agility activities um, give you good running mechanics. Because a lot of people now spend all the time like this. So they're really tight in this area. The bloke I mentioned a minute ago, Kelvin Giles, did a big study in Australia and he found that people were people, young people, as in their teens, were really tight in their hip area really tighten their hamstrings, tighten their shoulders, were unable to do basic movements. And I can get, I'm sure Dan will say the same, if we get a group of lads or girls out from, from, out from the street, they have really struggled to do a lot of basic movements. So all this needs to be underpinning, independent. So what it was, system building takes a long time. Um, Takes a lot of time in the RFU, it's a big organisation, we've got a lot of people to please, would be a wrong description, but a lot of people to bring on board. So if we're looking at building sports systems and good practice, basically we've got the clubs academies, we've got community clubs, we've got elite player groups, they're called different things at different academies, and now on top of that we've got the DPP as well. Now at each of those players should be doing some form of, I'll call it in inverted commas, strength and conditioning, but better to athletic development. They should be doing some form of athletic development. In order to do that athletic development, they need somebody to coach it. That's what S&C coach, strength and conditioning coach. But it could be a rugby coach who's been upskilled to deliver some of these movement patterns within their, uh, within their rugby session. It could be then that they, when they, as these people get older, players, not the coaches. As the players get older, they may do some of the stuff at a club <coughs> gym or a school gym, and they, or they may do it actually at home with some home kit, and that doesn't mean to say that their dad's bought 2,000 two uh, kilograms of weight in their garage. It means that they've got some sensible equipment that they can use themselves in the proper direction. And coming, I did say I would come back to the school and the, the um, academy. I think the schools are probably a lot better now, certainly some state schools that have money uh, and some public schools have responded to what's happening in the ACE program or the ACE program and responded to what's happened and have worked that a lot of the academies are doing with their young players and <coughs> put on board a lot of this stuff so that has been a good step forward. And to back that as well we've got SNC qualifications, and I don't mean those to become full-time qualifications, I mean the SNC qualifications that are by the RFU, that there's level one, two and three, which match uh, the uh, qualifications that for, develop, for coaching rugby or cricket or basketball or association football. So they were developed in, and we've got, we're getting more and more now rugby coaches, school teachers, etc., going through those qualifications so they can have a good and general understanding of um, athletic development for kids. And now what we have now is the DPP, 
developing player program, of which this is one. And I think that this, the stuff that's going on here today with like and what Saracens and Dan and his colleagues are doing out in um, out in the field, it's been mimicked to quite a few clubs. I think this is a, a, a Leith club in this, but it's been mimicked in a lot, and it can only be good for the the bed for the kids and the game in general. And that we've got a chance now that the DPPs, particularly with the with the use of um, modern technology in terms of all these twittery things that I don't understand, that sends out to everybody, we can really disseminate excellent good practice and the DPPs can be a real um, real beacon of good practice. And finally I'm going to leave you with a quote from uh, the old man Judah Bomper with a picture of a, a young girl who I haven't taken off the street, she's actually mine, um, but she's now about 10 years older than that and pretty confident rock climber. And that's what, that's what the guys like Dan are doing now. Not every kid's going to be talented, but every kid should have a chance. We, they can't come back to us when they're 20 and say, or 24 and say, look mate, I could have had a chance, but I knew nothing about my, my athletic development. I didn't have a chance of doing that. And even though, not even, even the wrong word, all those kids who then don't go on to play rugby, but go on to other sports, all those and those kids that go on and they play for Barnet or they play for Hendon, we're doing them a good, they were doing them a favour, better the wrong word again, we're doing them a favour in terms of making them better players, better physically developed, and potentially keeping them in the game for longer and resisting injury. With that, I'll hand over to Dan. <coughs> My presentation tonight. Um, I, I'm kind of going to go over uh, what us as a Saracens Academy have, have put together um, at our curriculum, what we do with the players when they enter into the academy system. And the academy system, like I spoke about a minute ago, it tends to um, begin in the about halfway through the under 15s year. So we, we take in uh, under 15s uh, around about January. Uh, we work through until under 18s uh, when they uh, may or may not get a contract with Saracens. Um, and what we put together is our, I guess, pathway to getting up there, what we do as the physical development. Um, we're trying to have a lot more influence within that DPP, that county system, um, and we're going to speak about something called JAD in a little while, um, and I think that touches on what Simon's on about the physical literacy side of things, and actually um, making sure our, our players are, are moving well, um, are coordinated and balanced, um, have mobile joints, and, and the importance of that. Um, I've got Plenty of videos. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to try and give you tonight was something you could take away and potentially use. Um, we try to push Jad onto as many people as possible. We're working with uh, young players um, as we, we really believe in it and we see the benefit of actually working on these movement <coughs> patterns um, and how that's going to affect them long term. Um, I plan on doing so, split into two bits because uh, I know we've all got short concentration as well, I do anyway. Uh, so we, we go through uh, the beginning part, so the JAD essentially, the curriculum, what is it? Um, and then we'll, we'll go on to some sort of speed work um, and some body manipulation stuff that we do within the academy. Uh, so if I, if I pop down, so what is our philosophy? And I, I guess I've just touched on this, is it's to get our, our players moving through um, movement patterns through the full range. And make sure they're stable and um, going well. And why do we do that? Um, so, uh, uh, it's looking at so in their physical development, um, we want to get them ready for elite rugby at the end of it. Um, if they have good movement patterns from an early age, and we manage to keep those throughout, we're going to be hopefully unlocking their athletic potential. Um, also, preventing injuries. Uh, I think that's probably maybe the most important. Thing we can work with young kids is no one wants to see them injured, we want to see them durable um, athletes. So, essentially, that's what we put in place. Um, I spoke about our curriculum, and the, this is our big wide curriculum um, how we do the stages we work through. Um, and if I, if I move more into like a, a, a stage one, essentially, so I spoke about the DPP from 13 to, to 15, um, what we look to do with them. So, it's working on those movement literacy. 
uh, things Simon spoke about a little while ago, um, through our, our JAD program, um, through coordination drills, like lab drills, through speed drills, um, and combat conditioning, uh, body manipulation type drills. Um, where is this generally done? So this, um, we don't have Saracen's Academy from 13 to 15 for good reason. Um, I think they need to be not necessarily specialising at that age, um, and still within counties if they're playing rugby. Uh, and it's not necessarily rugby players, I think. Um, everyone can be uh, benefit from actually some movement-based and coordination-based work. Um, this tends to happen obviously within the clubs, the counties, the schools. Um, and why is it important? I guess we've addressed this. Um, 13 to 15, a lot of young lads, rugby is an early developing sport. Where they, they generally, oh, sorry, generally be hitting puberty. They're going through stages of um, growth, um, athletic awkwardness, you see not being able to control them big long limbs and uh, can we try and reinforce good movement patterns to, to actually get them controlling their limbs and have that one performance benefit and two hopefully prevent some injuries. Uh, <coughs> so that brings us to JAD uh, and JAD is exactly that so it works on movement literacy um, and it's a number of movements, um, whole body movements <coughs> that uh, we look to try and reinforce as often as possible with, with the young players. Um, and um, yeah, why, why do we do this? <coughs> I'm gonna keep reiterating it, but it, um, good movement patterns can help decrease injury. Research has showed this. Um, it can help long-term development. You can move well, you can squat well, you can move through full range. Brilliant, you'll be more likely to be able to do that when you do start using resistant exercises, um, do you start doing other methods of training. Um, generally, if um, we were to pick out a sample of rugby players, without intervention, without us giving them something, they won't move well. Um, research has showed that. Um, and I think the well, second to last one that's quite interesting is um, research looked into a selection of players. and. Rugby players generally tend to be the big kids, the fast kids, the, the strong kids. Um, but there is stuff out there which says actually your movement quality can actually influence your selection for uh, whether it's your club team, your school team, your, your um, academy side. Um, for various reasons as well, because uh, you think about actual ex um, activities we do out there, and we touched upon that with the speed stuff. If you're not moving well, not coordinated, you're never going to be able to unlock your full speed potential, unlock your um, ability to get into different positions within rugby, within other sports. Um, our observations with this, so um, from doing our JAD program, you, you see a, um, a better body awareness, able to control their bodies. Um, you see faster progression through our system, it's just our system, it's, you can create your own systems, it's plenty of systems work for it's just our system. Um, functional transfer, I, I mean the easiest one to think about is if a player is unable to get into a good squat pattern, get through there, if that player happens to be a, a prop for example, he's never going to get into a good body height position for a scrum. Um, so uh, we're essentially unlocking that performance benefit um, and decrease chronic injury and um, I think what you find, there was almost uh, in rugby kind of like a, we spoke about the difference in the size of the players now, um, the strength of the players, and, and as soon as it became professional, everyone wanted their SNC coach, everyone wanted to get them bigger and stronger, and we wanted to get them as quick as possible. Um, but if you're gonna be doing that in a way that, I'd say the wrong way, um, that could lead to uh, those chronic injuries. Um, we, we all know the players got bad backs um, from lifting weights, you all know the players got groin issues um, and hopefully if we can get a good um, progression going, get there. Um, uh, where can we get this? So, we've, we put the, uh, we've got the videos, if any of you came a few years ago when we did this and we were saying uh, Chad would go up onto the website and it's taken a year for it to go up onto the website, um, we get the videos onto the website. Um, anyone wants the JAD programs we use within the counties, I 
not told Lewis, but I put his email address on there, so uh, he'll kindly deliver that one out to you, and maybe we can send it across the emails, so you might have been sent anyway. Um, so, Lewis, you're going to have to navigate the uh, website from here. So, yeah, guys, so obviously, just I'll touch on that, so like I said, everything we've, we've said a couple of times on a few of these seminars, so we're trying to um, put as much content for, to, to benefit kind of from these sessions and the sessions I'm doing when I'm going out to, to your clubs. Um, to kind of help you with new ideas. So Jad's a big part of that, and I think if, if, with, with anything, it's, uh, it's probably the, it's, there's all well and good having sort of different games in, in terms of a rugby sense, but it's this stuff that's probably um, not known as much about that the guys are going through, and the, uh, the stuff that's probably not as sort of straightforward. So uh, we've given you as many um, informational videos with that as well, and we'll hopefully just progress them up. So this is our main website, so it's um, It's all access, it is free onto it. Uh, so if you just go on to uh, community, um, you can either go on to rugby development and it's on there, or right at the bottom there, there's the coach education library. Um, so if you click onto that, and then we've got these four categories. Okay, so uh, the two top ones are your rugby content. Um, I'm hopefully trying to film, but tonight film a few of these sessions. So we've got these on there as well, and then add Jad development stuff here. Um, and it's all just in these tabs, basically. Um, so if you, if you, as you scroll through, So um, it's all contents on here. We've got a few stuff on that we'll use tonight that will get kind of neatened up a little bit. Um, we'll start from the top of the group. Um, so we're going to start from. I've got a list of the okay. books I uh, So I've run through the JAD program. And it's ten exercises. I'm, I just wanted to touch on kind of. Uh, um, this is brilliant. We're showing you videos of exercises, and but I think. Um, if we can look for a few key aspects of those and how we want to deliver that. Um, so, if I can find it on here, our first one is... Uh, so, the first exercise you'll find on the county jag will be what we call a... Uh, Sumo squat into overhead get up. So we're going to take a. Uh, the distance to the feet is going to be a little bit wider than your, your shoulder width. Um, I'm looking for the players to keep their toes pointing forwards. Uh, maybe if you think about clock 11 and 1 that clock, but try not to get any massive external rotation on those feet. Um, there's three stages to this. The first stage, you're going to try and keep your hamstring straight, get your hamstring stretch. You're going to move your hands all the way down to your feet. In that position, you will uh, take hold of your feet um, and then try and squat down as low as you can get there. Um, a trick with when you're getting them to do this one here is if you get your uh, elbows into the inside of your knees um, and just encourage them to try and push their knees out a little bit, it allows them to open up their groins a little bit more and get a little bit lower for your squat. Um, the overhead get up part is now essentially we're looking for this good squat, squat pattern here. So um, we're keeping a, a straight back. We're trying to pull the arms back into an overhead squat position. Um, and then we're encouraging them to uh, stand up. And if you encourage them to squeeze their glutes to get their hips through at the top here. Um, just a few points, uh, things we look for on, on a squat pattern. Um, if you're looking from uh, if you want to scroll back from straight on, we want to have your knees looking in line with your your knees in line with your, your feet. Um, I don't want to see any knees collapsing inwards. You mentioned about the toes, um, not letting the toes externally rotate out through there. Um, weight is through your your midfoot to your heels, so heels are on the floor. So one of the big issues is going to be heels coming up. So how do you how do you compensate the heels? What what exercise? You let you make them go through as full range as they can with their heels on the floor. So they will always be able to get their heels on the floor if they think about it. Um, one of the little tricks if they want to get a little bit more range is why we do this and hold the feet. You can use your own body as a bit of an anchor to squat a little bit deep, deeper. And we're looking for them to work through as as much range as possible. So we're getting that essentially stretch through range of motion. Um, and yeah, that's the next one. Step one. Uh, 
Uh, so we've got a static lunge, um, and once again, it's going to be the front leg which is doing most of the work. The weight's going to be going through that heel again, so we don't see any heels come up to the floor. The width that they're going to, uh, so we look from the front side here, so knee once again in line with your toes. Uh, and then from the side angle here, um, we're looking to keep the uh, torso upright. Uh, we're bending the back knee to get the range of motion. Um, and we're not letting our knee come drive forward. So if the foot distance is too small, the knee's going to be driving far out over that toe. Yeah, and it's a static, so they're just going up and down. And we might find with some of the lads if they've got a tight hip through the hip flexors and tight through the range of motion, this, this might be a stretch for them as well. Um, if not, you're also working on that stability in a split stance position, which you get all the time. Um, switch through to that joint. So that's your lunge, you're going to take a nice wide base, so feet are going to be out wide. Um, your toes are going to be pointing forwards to begin with again. They're going to encourage them to keep their chest up nice and tall, and essentially you're going to sit your bum back over the heel that you're going to be working towards. So his hips shift across, and if you look at the bottom position here, he's essentially sitting in his squat position, but over to the side there. Um, and once again, we're working through range, you're working at your mobilizing the, the groin of the spine <coughs> and we're encouraging them to keep their chest up and weight through their heels. Sorry, just move to the side a little bit. My only way, sorry. Okay. <laughs> So drop lunge, once again, it's just another variation of a, a lower limb. Exercise, uh, the front leg is the one that's going to be doing the work here. Um, you step across, try and keep your shoulders square, and you're essentially bending your, um, you're bending your back knee to get the range of motion. Torso stays up straight, weight goes through your heels, you'll find you'll see a, a common pattern in a lot of the exercises. Um, stop signs. So stop signs is a brilliant one, um, especially for those who may have uh, tight hips or may need a little bit of balance. We're essentially teaching them to use uh, their hips as hinges. Um, <clears throat> so, they're standing on, on one leg, weights mid foot to heel, heels flat on the floor. Um, we look to keep uh, the leg relatively straight, so <coughs> what I will allow is, if you think about a, a slight bend in the knee, but that now is therefore locked and it's going to stay there. Um, and you're hinging at the hips. Trying to keep your back nice and straight. And then finishing as well. So it's very important that it's not just coming down, uh, giving up, down, and then you're squeezing your posterior chain, your, your glutes and your hamstring to come back up, right? And we're engaging those, those muscles of the back of the leg. Um, yeah, so I guess with all these exercises, what, what's important to consider is um, when they're doing it, their range of motion might not be great. So you might find someone who isn't actually able to get all the way down there um, to begin with. So uh, if um, <coughs> so, if you make them work through the range as much range as possible. Um, so ensuring that they keep their back nice and straight. So as soon as the back starts bounding, they've gone too far. Um, so you may only be getting down <coughs> there. Next time, back straight, try and work a little bit lower, lengthen that muscle. Uh, once again, working in uh, back of the legs, the glutes, so um, glute activation is really important. This is where you get a lot of the power from. Um, so we are encouraging them to, to squeeze this and, and drive their hips through. 
<clears throat> shoulders on the floor. If you look at the knee at the top position, you're essentially there at uh, almost a 90 degree. Um, and we're looking for that straight line down from the knee to the shoulders, because that shows me that he's squeezing his glute, he's getting his hips all the way through. Um, get them to think about pushing through their heel to drive their hips up and up. So single leg eccentric squat, um, so we're working on uh, controlling your body as you as you squat down. Um, if you have a chair, if you have benches nearby, you can get them to your side. If not, use your partner. Um, we're looking for the alignment of the ankle and knee here. So what I don't want to, what I'm looking for is no movement in that knee there and a, and a controlled descent all the way down. Um, once again, we're working through the heel. <coughs> We're keeping the torso nice and upright and we're controlling the movement as low as we can. Now, if they do have that wiggle their knees coming in, how do you cue them to stop that? Um, you know, the easiest, the, I guess the easiest cue is just to get them to think about it and focus on it uh, and control it. Um, you can think about getting them to squeeze their glutes and their abs, get their sparring. Um, but if, if they're doing it and not really thinking about it, just popping all over the place, I would like to keep that stable and what you might find you have to do if they can't control it all the way down to a player who's, who's laying quite low is just take that range of motion up a little bit so let's work on a small little squat this week next week we a little bit lower um, a couple of months you might find they can easily go down to the floor uh, and a lot of a lot of positions you get into is it's all single it's a uh, single leg so we can control, we can balance that simple leg. A plank. Um, this area is, is where the force gets transferred through. It's, it's good to have a good core, nice and tight. Um, <clears throat> what we're looking for, shoulders to hips, we're looking for a straight line. Um, common mistakes, I guess, with the plank is they round their backs. Let's bring their backs in the scapulas in a good position. Um, they actually tilt at the hips, so we get there, they're not actually engaged in their pores, they're just sitting into the hips, so let's flatten it off. Um, and it's just good for them. Pores, pores very important. And the final one is so uh, we've got uh, a side plank position. Again, we're trying to not let the bridges keep the hips up so there's a straight line going across there. They're staying square, they pull their shoulder back into good position so they're not punching at the upper body. Nice and square at the top. Um, and then once again, they're just engaging the side. There we go, so you can see his shoulders are square. Stop arms leaning back a little bit. But And it's 10 exercises, so um, <coughs> these are 10 exercises that we give out to um, the counties um, uh, and we encourage the players to do as often as possible um, <coughs> and we see good results from doing this uh, and what's been uh, interesting
interesting for us as well as, as I guess we've been running the JAD program for a couple of years now. Um, we've got the county doing these as of this year, so um, essentially I guess until the under-15s came in, they've been doing it for six, seven months. Um, the difference in quality of movement when they come into the academy um, post-Christmas on the 15 year uh, is uh, brilliant. They're, they're so much better. And what that means is that we can then, when therefore we, we look to, to load these players, um, which I'll touch on, which is movement-based loading them. Uh, um, they're actually able to do the technical aspects of spotting with a load, of hinging at the hips to pick something up um, well. And it's just from doing 10 exercises, which if they focus on, they can get through it in 10, 15 minutes. So it's almost like a, um, you could give it as a, as a warm up drill to exercise. Um, we tell them they can do it as a recovery session because they're stretching, it's not too strenuous. Um, we've had uh, buy in from a few schools who, who put um, these sort of exercises within uh, curriculum warm ups. Um, so actually the, the players are working on their movement qualities rather than just doing uh, <coughs> static stretches, which um, will be far more <coughs> beneficial for them going forward. So what would be the, so there's 10 exercises, you say you could do them all within sort of 10, 15 minutes, how many reps would they be doing for the week exercise? Yeah, so we'd say 10. Thank so you. 10 reps focusing on the form, so it's not a rush, it's not we're getting down to squat, we're coming back up. We're going to take our time doing a sumo squat. We're going to work our range. We're going to get down nice and low. Um, we're going to pull our arms up into a good overhead position. Uh, we're going to squeeze our glutes at the top. Um, ten, ex uh, 10 exercises, 10, second, uh, 10 reps each exercise. Uh, we do 30 seconds for the plank and the side plank at the end. We generally do um, two to three sets of it. Um, depending on how kind we're feeling. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's, it's something they can actually uh, blast through, and well, you might look at it and think, well, actually, that's, that's a bit repetitive. They're doing the same thing over and over again. But um, what I think is important is actually reinforcing these good uh, movements, these these foundation movements, this physical <coughs> literacy, um, whilst their bodies are changing, um, whilst they are taking knocks or various things um, during, and they're getting um, maybe sensations in their patterns. So we, we focus on the good form, get them doing it over and over again and, and the transfer and to be able to control your body when you're having to run around, you're having to do um, rugby based activities is, is what we're after. So can have this as homework as well as like in session, but how yeah. how do you then measure progress? Obviously you're looking but for each yeah. individual, what okay. sort of things do you record and how do you do that? Yeah, so um, I, I've got a slide which touches on this a little bit later. Um, it comes into um, when we talk about our, I guess, our, our resistance training, our, our curriculum, as well as weights curriculum. Um, and what we look for, what we assess is, is the, the main one is the overhead squat. Um, and it's the ability to be able to get an overhead squat through full range. Um, and like Simon spoke about, Far eastern countries, everyone sits like that. We don't, we sit in chairs, we punch over, we sit in cars and long journeys, uh, training sessions where our hip flexors get tight. Um, <coughs> we don't put an emphasis on moving well. Um, so we assess them through the overhead squat as an assessment tool. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on that in a, a slide a bit later, what we look for in that. Um, why? I guess there's lots of functional movement screens you can do and the further you get through it the more we may get them doing but um, if you've got a lot of players to look after um, what we found is the overhead squat we will be getting the most detail out of um, what we do and um, <coughs> I, I, I'll talk about this later when we go through the bronze program which is essentially our, our movement based program, weights program but we tell them that um, we're going to look at your overhead squat beforehand and then you won't be able to move out of bronze into what we call silver the next stage up until your overhead squat is good. So they've got this um, <coughs> emphasis to 
actually when it's important to me now movement. How many times a week or month should they be doing this? Uh, so Jad, uh, we turn up as often as possible. Um, and for um, when they're in with us in contact, we will do it every single session um, during the pre-season. Um, we encourage them to try and do it four, maybe five times a week. As, as often as possible, you get the best results. Um, depending on the player, I guess, a little bit, depending on where they are is how often they need to be doing it to keep themselves in track. Obviously, if you've got um, a big second row who's just gone through his massive growth spurt, and we, the more we get him doing this, that should be better for him. Um, if we've got a small nine who's still not actually gone through the growth spurt, and it's actually really good at doing this, then just get him doing every now and again. Maybe they'll get it. But as often as possible, because we're trying to reinforce those good um, patterns, really. Just in that overhead squat, mm. what happens if they can't get down to their six feet? You know, to start off with, you just, just do a squat. Yeah, just get them doing as low as they can. But you don't again reinforce it by just trying to get them to do other sort of static stretches, and then you'll just go through um, this program to you know so, that movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, <coughs> stretching. So uh, like I said, you might be stiff, and it might be for a variety of reasons, and your body's very clever. Um, I, I, I generally think a lot. Of Stiffness is because your body's trying to either protect itself or it's making itself stiff for a reason. Um, so maybe it's a case that uh, your hamstring is actually quite weak and um, you need to be doing more stalk stance to, to strengthen them and make yourself and your body more comfortable getting down into that position there. Um, on a very rare occasion, I may give players um, a static stretching program to do, some hamstring stretches. Um, if not, actually get them doing JAD. They're really, really rubbish. Get them doing that one, that at least that one aspect of jab. Get them doing it as often as possible, and every single time they find that they get alert, alert, alert. Um, and what I should have done is put up some before and after photos. But what we have found with the overhead squat is it works. So um, we will overhead squat them before they've done any of this when they come into the academy, um, and we've overhead squatted them after a pre-season. Brilliant results from it. We've overhead squatted them six months later, and we found that there's not as much issues within the group. Um, and it's going to depend on and I like all the stuff you give them to give to the players as a, a strength and conditioning coach, a teacher, um, a rugby coach. How much they buy into and they do it depends on what sort of player you've got. So you'll get the, the player that takes on board everything and does it religiously. Um, he'll do jad every day, um, and sometimes because I will essentially see a lot of players for a physical development session once a week. Um, maybe I don't see them for two or three weeks because they've got other commitments on. And you can you can tell the guys that have been doing it, and you can tell the guys that um, don't do it. And when we get to them a, a, a unloaded bar to hold above their head and get them to squat, they're they're not very good at it. Have you been doing jab? Yeah, a little bit, and then another guy I've been doing jab. Yeah, I do it all the time. Um, so yeah. With the one-legged squat, yes. Are you prioritising? Are you prioritising posture? Are you over? over Everything's posture. Every, uh, so it's form and it's technique. Yeah. yeah so, um, but posture's not. So it's no good for me if they're doing a, a one-legged squat and they're collapsing the mountain bags. Um, they're not engaging their core, they're not engaging their, the scaps to keep themselves in a good position here. Um, and your body is a, a, a brilliant system and it's a system of everything works. So if they're essentially, if they're slumping, well, then that might be a reason why they're slumping or that's going to might affect down there. If they're not activating their glutes, for example, that's going to have a knock-on effect for their knee and their ankle. So uh, we try to look at everything. Um, as, as you probably know, it's easier to do a, a squat to the floor if you found your back and come onto your toes. And probably everyone can do that, but can everyone sit on their heels, keep their chest up nice and tall? Um, so this is this is Jad, um, and I can't stress enough uh, the importance of it. But I guess it's one facet in in the program we do in 
in working on physical literacy, and it's just working on those movement qualities. Uh, what I'll touch on, I'll, I'll take a, a brief little break, but um, what we'll touch on is, is, is speed drills, um, and what can we can be doing to help improve the running mechanics, because running is a skill, um, and um, some body manipulations and combat drills that we do with the academy.